So now awesome. I'm going to turn the floor over to John Boker. Cool. Hey, thanks, Bill. Yeah, I think um, anybody that's attended before, I think you guys all know Bill. Bill's pretty uh, popular within the Nashville community, and I've always liked how much and how much time he actually spends trying to get people connected with Azure. He does all this time for all this stuff for free. Um, so I'll definitely give him a shout out and thank him once in a while. I'm sure he doesn't hear enough. And then, uh, Bill, I can't actually share my screen. Could you pass me rights to do so? Okay, yeah, this, this is the first time, for those folks who are listening, this is the first time we've used Zoom for this. So let me see how I can do this. <laughs> yeah, while Bill does that, does anybody have any topics that um, they run to issues from a security standpoint at their jobs currently? Or any topics you want me to put into this? John, I just made you a host. See if you can share your screen now. I made oh. you the, the host. The host. You are the host. the host. I think we only have host. we only have a license for one. Yeah, there we go. I see your screen. Awesome. Yeah, great. So hi everybody. I am John Boker. Um, I've been in information um, technology and information security for about 15 years. I'm currently the chief information security officer at In Contracts. Um, don't let the C-level um, title um, confuse you. I'm very technical. I like to jump in and actually work through issues. I like um, very challenging pro uh, problems. Um, throughout my career, I've obtained about 25 certificates. Um, I don't like to brag about that because they're just certificates. Um, I like working with individuals that are very good with their hands and treat people very well. Um, hungry, humble, and smart. Throughout the years, I got two degrees also, degrees in business, so that I would have a little bit of diversity. Um, so let's jump in and look at Azure Security Basics. So what we're going to go over is IAM, Authentication and Conditional Access, Azure Active Directory, AAD, Groups, Group Policy, Networking Best Practices and Network Security Groups, Encryption, Protocols, SSL Certs, Key Vaults, and Security Center. So, Let's just be interactive. So if you guys have a question when we're going through this, just raise your hand. Um, whenever I attend these myself, um, I usually write down questions as I go, but by the end of it, there's other people asking questions or, um, you know, it's on a completely different topic and it's hard for me to go back. So if you have questions, jump in, ask it. Good chance that somebody else is asking that question as well. If you think any of my information is incorrect, um, keep it to yourself. No, I'm kidding. So if you think anything is wrong or you have a different opinion about something, I'll bring it up. Let's chat about it. Um, and I'll tell you this, and my class can tell you this as well. I'll be aware of the dad jokes. Um, when I get on a roll, um, I tend to tell incredible jokes. And I try and make this as fun as possible because it's security. Um, security is not as simple as right and wrong. Secure, not secure, ones and zeros. It's really around the risk of X happening and building controls around it. So sometimes there's many ways to reduce the risk of X and whatever that is. Now we're gonna get into the cloud stuff and some of it will be high level, some of it will be um, very detailed. Uh, one second, let me set this up so I can admit people. And let's see here, perfect. We're just going to cover a couple of information security topics and kind of concepts before we dive into some of the Azure technologies. So CIA Triad. If you haven't seen this before, it's a very easy way to describe the three areas that we try and focus on in information security. So we care about availability. Why would we care about availability when we're not in operations? Really, it's if our systems aren't available, um, we're, the company's not going to make money. Right? We have to protect something. And those systems have to be available. Integrity, making sure that things are, that have not been changed, that the data has its integrity and it hasn't been modified. And then confidentiality. All right, so defense and depth, right? It is an approach to cybersecurity in which a series of defensive mechanisms, it doesn't have to be one, it can be multiple, are layered in order to protect valuable data and information. If one mechanism fails, another steps up to immediately, steps up immediately to thwart an attack. 
Good example of that, of that is probably MFA. Right, if somebody gets my password, and I have MFA set up, I've got an extra control in place that can thwart that attack. And if you're not aware, all hackers look like this. I don't know if you've met any, they typically have a mask over their head, they hold up their laptop with one arm, and they type with one hand, they're very skilled. Identity and access management, so I am. So, when we look at IAM, we really want to take a look and take an approach of role-based access control. So we want to restrict access based on a person's role within an organization. And that can be difficult. And there's a lot of different ways we can organize our um, authentication, our users and groups within Azure. We can do it at the subscription level. So let's say we're a very large organization. We have a lot of different subscriptions. Finance may need access to billing for all of those subscriptions. So rather than going into each subscription and adding that group or those groups of users or just a specific user, we can go ahead and create management groups. And then we can apply those management groups to any subscription that we want. Now, this is going to be the case in large organizations. If you're in a smart, small organization, you should not have this many subscriptions. And I would be surprised if you did. So within subscriptions, the permissions are actually, are actually handled from top to bottom. So management group to subscription, the resource group to resource. So if we have a VM, for example, we could set the permissions down here at the actual VM level, at the resource level. And that will not be inherited all the way up. It only works one way and that's down. So whatever we set at the management group, if we add somebody as an owner to the subscription, they're gonna have ownership rights all the way down to the resource. But it's not always that simple. So we have, we have virtual networks, we have um, resource groups, we have VMs, we have uh, virtual machines. How do we actually organize our users? We may have two subscriptions, one for development, one for production. We wanna make sure developers have access and maybe elevated access to the development environment, that sandbox environment. But we don't want them to have elevated access within um, production. It could be as well, we have a group of individuals that are SQL administrators. Now, if we give them admin capabilities at the resource group, and we have multiple VMs in there, and a SQL server, they're gonna have admin access to that SQL server and all those VMs. We may not want that to happen. So, how do we determine how we want to stage those permissions or how we want to configure those permissions. And how we can do that is using different roles within, within um, Azure, within IAM. So we can give somebody, for example, SQL administrator rights and ownership rights for SQL administrator, I'm sorry, SQL administrator contributor rights or database contributor. We can then apply that to the subscription. And now our SQL administrators have access to all the databases within that subscription. We may wanna break that up even further and do it at the resource group level. So there's a ton of different ways to do this. How do we do it? So here's how I wanna attack it. And some may argue with this methodology. I'm an expert, so it's obviously right. I'm joking, right? If you guys have suggestions or things that you think that we could do better here, tell me. I'd love to put it in here. So the first thing is actually looking at where you are now. Now, if you are coming in, if you are handling the infrastructure or the operational side of an Azure subscription, there's a good chance it was there before you started. There's a good chance you came into an organization that was a startup. They grew to 100, 200 individuals. And now they're at the point where they need somebody to manage this information or manage the security and the operations of this environment. Developers are really good at developing. They're not always that great at security. So 
You want to go in and see where are you now? Jot it down, document it out. Put it on a whiteboard and then put it into a Visio diagram so you can understand it. And then take your users and put them in the groups. There might be some users that are DBAs that are also server administrators. They may be part of two different groups. We want to make sure those users get put into the correct groups. Um, then what we want to do is we want to diagram the subscriptions, resource groups, and resources. So we have all these subscriptions, we have all these resource groups, and we have all these resources. How should they be organized? Do these resources need to move to different resource groups? Are they okay staying where they're at? Where do we need to actually apply the permissions and how much, how much permissions do we actually need? Then link those groups to the diagram and take it to other people and gain approval. You want other people to look at this. There's a good chance you're gonna go through a change management process. You wanna be able to review what's currently there and what's not there. Now, I see a lot of times where people, somebody will ask for access. You might only have one DBA. So that person will give that person access to that specific resource or to that resource group, or just give them database um, contributor rights across the entire subscription. Well, that's fine. What happens when another DBA comes on board? And what happens when an auditor comes in, on board? You have to go through every resource, every resource group, every subscription, and you have to find each user and who has access to what. And then deprovisioning the users is a nightmare. You got to actually delete their accounts or just disable it or remove them from certain groups and you can't because of the permissions they have within the subscription. So I would say never put users, never put users within different resources or groups or subscriptions. You should have them within groups. SQL administrator joins and he's part of a certain group. You can just add him to the AAD security groups. And then they will inherit all the permissions you've already staged. You build a new resource group or you build a bunch of servers, all you have to do is add that group to it and everybody will get those permissions. Use groups. And when auditors come in, you can just print out a list of all your groups and what they have access to. Simple, easy, um, and done. So we go to execute. So we're gonna go ahead, create those AAD groups. We're going to log into AAD and we're going to name them appropriately so we know what they are later on. And they should be descriptive enough to where other people know as well. We're going to assign the groups to our different resources, subscriptions, and resources. And then we're going to add the users to it. We want to make sure everybody has access before we go and delete permissions. Then we want to test and have a peer evaluate what we put in place. Maybe we gave somebody too many permissions. It's better to find it now than when you walk into an audit. Cool. Any questions before I move forward? And you don't have to raise your hand. You just have to take yourself off mute and jump in. Lively group. Cool. I know security is not the funnest topic. We're going to have some fun. So authentication and conditional access. So multi-factor authentication. A lot of people know what this is. But it's where a user is prompted during the sign-in process for additional form of ident identification. Looks like we got a chat here. Good so far. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah. I, I have a question uh, quick, if it's okay, on the previous. As far as uh, uh, we ran into an issue, interestingly enough, where we had, we had so many um, resource groups and uh, individual resources and all that, that we had to start using groups because we actually hit a limit within a subscription as far as access. Could you maybe speak to that a little bit as far as the limits on number of individual permissions you can have? So we got yeah, forced okay. into using groups, uh, rightly so, but for an interest for a different reason. Um, because we actually hit a limit. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, honestly. I've never hit that limit. Okay. I would say, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit with the networking as well. People do this all the time with VNets. Adding complexity doesn't always, it doesn't always add better security, right? Or um, too much organization could be bad. 
right? Too many resource groups makes it very difficult to troubleshoot. And that's why it's important to remember the A as part of the CIA triad, the availability. So we can make things too complicated. We can overthink things just in IT in general. And it's, I definitely do this all the time where we will actually impact operations. We'll impact availability because it's hard to troubleshoot or hard. To, I mean, look at what you have to do now. So you have to stop what you're doing. Whatever projects you have going on, you probably can't deploy additional things because you have to go back and clean up all the resource groups and you have to clean up all the groups. And I'm sure that can be very painful. Um, don't know what the, the, the limit is. I would say if you even got halfway to that point, you're probably overcomplicating things. Now, I'm not your organization, that's just my opinion. Um, yeah, so MFA. So it's a sign-in process to, for additional forms of identification. I know a lot of you guys actually know this. I'm adding this for the individuals that uh, might be new to this. So turn it on, right? MFA should be turned on. Um, and it works, it's pretty simple. You type in your username and password. Once the, the authentication service receives it, it will check whatever, um, whatever is your primary MFA uh, preference. It could be text, it could be um, pushing a token using Microsoft Authenticator. And it pushes it to your device. It says, hey, is this you? And you get to say yes or no. It lets you in or it doesn't let you in. Pretty simple. So who should it be enabled for, right? Everyone. Right? Everyone should have MFA turned on. And you'll hear this a lot where, um, and I've had this in organizations, well, you know, this is gonna impact our operations. And if we add additional steps, uh, people might not use it. And um, okay, right? Um, that's a legitimate concern. So address those concerns, talk to the individuals. What is the problem? What is gonna stop you from using this? And let's talk about some of the threats. And if you get in the right, if you get the right buy-in in, I've been able to turn on MFA across an entire organization of 300 individuals in less than three days. And it was successful and everybody worked through it. I've been in other organizations where they tried dragging their feet for several months. So it really depends on the organization, it turns, depends on the, the culture. But turn it on for everybody, except for service accounts. Right, if you turn it on for service accounts and you're running a Windows service for that, um, it's gonna fail. So, Conditional access, I love conditional access. It's something that's gonna become, um, people are talking about now, and, it's, and I believe it's gonna become very mainstream this next year. Um, the last two years, everybody's been talking about zero trust. I think it's gonna be conditional access. And really it's gatekeeping, honestly. You can just equate conditional access to gatekeeping. So I don't want to, I don't want to get into the business of telling people what trying to secure their devices when they come in the door or trying to stop people from bringing it in. Susan got a new MacBook for her, and I shouldn't use Susan, right? That's a horrible example. Bob brought in a MacBook into the organization. He wants to use it for Azure. He wants to use it for his, um, let me make sure nobody's actually waiting. Yep, cool. Yeah, he wants to use it for um, email and whatever else. So how do we prevent him from doing that? Me, I like having a BYOD policy. It saves the company money. If people want to bring their devices, so be it. They want to bring their phones, they want to bring their laptops, that's less that we have to manage, it's less that we have to buy, but they could be insecure. What's cool about conditional access is we can actually choose to let them in or not. So we can say, hey, if you don't have your firewall enabled on your Mac device, if it's not encrypted, if you don't have a strong password, and if you're not set up on my Intune environment, you can't get email, you can't get access to these individuals. For my developers who love to use their desktops at home. That's fine, you can use your desktops. But I wanna see what's actually installed on the desktops. You have to have Intune set up. And rather than me having to chase them down, they have to come to me. Hey, I want access. I wanna be able to use my desktop for development and to get access to the environment. Cool, I want you to too. Let's just make sure it's secure. Work with this guy over here. Also, you get some other um, abilities. So we could say if somebody is not within their home region where they're traveling out of state, that they can't get to certain applications. We can also tell them that if somebody is within the same region, we can even say Brentwood, Brentwood, Tennessee. If they sign in from Brentwood, they never have to use MFA. Now I'm not suggesting you do that. It really depends on what they're accessing your organization and all of it, right? We have to look at the risk associated, but you have that ability. 
hey, we're going to turn on MFA for the entire organization. No worries. If they are near their home or they're near the office, they don't have to use it. It's only if they're anywhere else because we want to get all that high risk taken care of in the medium. We're not too concerned about the low risk. I mean, it's there, but it's not keeping us up at night. Yeah. And um, there's some use cases with that. So one thing with conditional access is we can disable legacy off. We can say if an application is using legacy off or if their endpoint client is using legacy off, just don't let them in. And I, I love this, right? Gatekeeping. It's the one place in the world where gatekeeping works great. Everywhere else, it's hard. Um, yeah, block access except for specific apps. So let's get into AED. Hmm, excuse me. Groups and group policy. So what's great about AAD is Azure will tell you, right? Well, they will tell you if there are certain services that um, are configured properly, if you need to change some things with your organization. And please, one thing I don't like is just opening up a book and saying, follow the book. Right? There's a lot of information out there for information security. You should think for yourself, what is the risk? For example, just-in-time access. If you look at Security Center, it will say turn it on. Your organization may not need it, and it may actually add risk by enabling. It really depends on the situation. So I shouldn't just blindly turn that on because Security Center tells me to or Microsoft. I have to decide for myself if it matches my organization. And also, is the juice worth the squeeze? So if I have to spend 80 hours to turn something on and it only remediates a small amount of risk, is that the best use of my time? Or should I be focusing on another area? really want to look at what those high risk items are and actually address those first. A couple of things you could do to secure your identity infrastructure. So strengthen your credentials. I think we all know this. Reduce your attack surface area. Threat response and intelligence and, and enable end user self-service. These four points I actually took from Microsoft. This is Microsoft's um, suggestions and I like it a lot. I think it's um, simplifies it, and it's a very good approach. Now, a lot of people argue with this. I, I sent this deck to actually a couple of friends to look over this, and they argued, um, I think we talked about 16 character passwords for an hour, to the point where I probably could have just removed it and saved myself a lot of grief. But I like 16 character passwords. And we can talk about that, if anybody's interested. Um, I don't want to hold up the discussion for this. We can do it maybe if we take a break. One year change interval. If people have 16 character passwords and they have MFA turned on, I'm okay letting them change their passwords once a year. It's gonna take somebody much longer to crack that 16 character password. And let's say somebody gets that. They take that 16 character password, they use it with a Yahoo account, Yahoo gets breached, and now somebody has that password. They still have to get past the MFA. And I'm gonna know about it anyway, because I'm gonna see attack from a different region. So. This is a good one. Um, and this came out, I wanna say a year ago, could be wrong, custom banned password list. So Microsoft gives you the ability to actually add words or passwords that you don't wanna use. So you can go out there and get a dump of all the passwords on the dark web and you can upload all of them to prevent any of your users from using passwords that have been breached in other services. So if Susan in accounting, accounting for example, um, used the same password for her Yahoo account, and her Yahoo account got breached six months ago, that she can't use that password. And then AD smart lockout, right? If somebody's hammering away, let's block them. Threat response and intelligence, right? So send your logs to your security team, and some of you might be the security team. There's a couple of things you can do with your logs. So you can use Microsoft's identity service that will actually look at some of your logs and alert you to anomalies. A very cheap and easy way to set up a SIM is using um, Azure Sentinel. I used it before, it's pretty decent. Um, you have to use KQL, but it's pretty good. Um, or you can send it to Security Onion, a bunch of different SIMs. But you can automate it. So for example, I can write a PowerShell script 
that if I notice somebody is attacking my servers from China and they're trying to access um, a port that's open, but they are, um, they have a malicious payload within the packet. My program can, Sentinel can see that, my SIM can see that, I can have it automatically execute a PowerShell script to connect to my subscription, connect to my MSG, and add that IP <coughs> to a block list. I can do that automatically. I don't need to be called in the middle of the night. And also you can leverage public and private threat feeds. They usually come with SIMs. Reduce your attack surface area. So block legacy off, just block it. Conditional access, which we talked about. App consent policies. So I think some of you have actually heard that, that SAMs got breached this year, right? I mean, they, they got breached, they lost a bunch of credit card information, which they had an email. Um, I believe they had an email. But how they were breached was somebody gained access to um, a privileged user's email box. They didn't get it through email and password. What happened was the user received an app consent request and because they weren't filtering them. They went ahead and clicked and allowed an app to access their email system. And from there, somebody used those permissions to farm information out from their subscription. So this was on the Risky Biz podcast. There was a lot of talk about this. It used to be you had to have um, AAD premium, I don't know, I think it was like version three or something, the privileged identity to get the ability to actually filter app consent. Um, Microsoft opened that up. It's not as robust as the pay for feature, but you can actually limit who can, um, not just on and off, you can actually put rules around which apps are allowed and which apps aren't allowed. So check that out. Most organizations by default, if you set up a subscription, they allow all apps and for anybody to install those apps. But if you went and looked at your subscription, you would probably find 20 apps installed that you probably didn't install. So what do they have access to? Doesn't mean it's bad. You just have to evaluate it and see what the risk is associated. Then enable end user self-service, right? Allow them to reset their credentials. They know when they typed in their password in the website that they shouldn't have. They get an email, a phishing link, they click on it, they type it in, oh crap, oh crap, oh yeah, I remembered, I wasn't supposed to do that. I don't want them emailing me at night, and if they do email me at night, I may not be looking at it. I want them to just go and reset their credentials, really quick, and they should know how to do that. Hey, I messed up, I reset my credentials already, just wanted to let you know. Awesome, you get a gold star. And group policy, group policy is still around. There's so many administrators that hate group policy. I'm one of the people that actually likes it. So if you have AAD, you can have a management server, or you can even install it on your laptop. Um, you want the machine to have, um, to be part of your AAD domain, but go ahead and install the MMC console and then you can connect to AAD and set policies. What policies do we want to set? So I can manage all my administrators. So let's say I have um, 100 servers and they have them broken up per product. And I want my application support team to only have access to those servers. Now I can PowerShell script that, but it makes it very difficult to audit them. And as people build servers, it makes it very difficult to make sure permissions match across all of them. So I can set up a group policy and drop the computers within that OU. So I can have a administrators group I can disable certain security items. So when I deploy a VM, as long as I drop it in the OU I want to, it'll actually set it. Um, I can enable Windows Defender Enforcement. And yeah, we can do that in other areas as well. But I can also configure logs where I want those logs to go. And um, yeah, it's not as robust as having your own domain controller on site. And thank God, because 50% of the policies, you probably would never use anyway. I know I did it, right? But there's some key ones that I probably would. So easy to walk into an audit, SOC audit, PCI audit, whatever, show your servers, what groups they're in, and then what policies you have set. You can literally print it out, 
on pad and on to paper, hand it to your auditor, and they will accept that instead of having to log into every server. Or take a population and go and take a sample of the population and then test each of those. Cool. Um, before we get into networking best practices, why don't we take a quick 10 minute break? Um, we're probably halfway through the deck anyway. Um, and then I'm going to be around if anybody wants to ask any questions. Uh, we'll start back up at 655. I feel like I know Allison. I've seen that name before. Yeah, I met you uh, almost a year ago today, actually, when you first got to Nashville. Yeah, you were looking to go back to Atlanta, right? Uh, I am, but I'm in Redmond now. That's cool. I mean, I'm, I'm going to try to do the whole work from home thing. Uh, yes. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so it all worked out. That's awesome. Yeah. I almost feel like we should play some music during the break. <laughs> we could put some elevator music. <laughs> yeah. Or you could sing for us. Uh -oh. you, don't, you, don't, you don't know what you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, what actually, kind of music do you to? Actually, my son and daughter sing, but I, I can't carry a tune, so... Well, while, while we're on a break, if anybody you know has anything that they want to talk about related to the group or anything else, feel free. You know, we're we're an informal group. Hey, Bill. This is Gopi. Hey, Gopi. How you doing? Good. Hey, John. Thanks for taking care of this, and uh, thanks to this group um, for doing uh, everything. So I work with Bill uh, in Redapt MDC team. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. I probably, um, I don't know if I met you in person. I went to a couple of the groups um, right before the pandemic. I was at like two or three of them. Well, that, that, that's, he, Gopi's not local, right? <laughs> Gopi. Ah. Yeah, yeah. I'm from, um, uh, same, Bellevue, Redmond area, from Seattle. Okay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> awesome. It's nice to meet you. Yeah. Yeah, Gopi's a good guy. He's one of our best engineers. <laughs> don't tell your boss. Don't tell my boss I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure if I can uh, contribute to this group in future sessions, but I'm happy to uh, if I can. Okay. For any topics like WVD or any uh, any Aisha related topics. So. Yeah, WVD is a pretty hot topic. We had a we had a talk of three or four months ago, I think, on WVD, but we're probably due for another one because there's been a lot of changes. What's, uh, what's WVD again? Oh, I'm sorry, Windows Virtual Desktop. Oh, yeah. Oh, that talk was fantastic. Especially with everybody working from home, you know? Yep. Well, that was fantastic. That was uh, one of my favorites. So I was actually going to deploy um, a remote desktop farm using 2008-2012 methodology. And then when I saw that you could actually do remote desktop He's a Windows 10. Uh, it was a game changer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the multi session. That's cool. Yep. Which we're kind of using Bastion now. I like Bastion. Uh, yeah, I call that Jumpbox as a service. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, recently people are using Bastion because it's secure, right? So there's been a lot of changes. There's, there's uh, you know, Azure Front Door, which is similar to traffic manager but better hmm. in many ways <laughs> a 
lot of, lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of enhancements. Are, Azure changes every few weeks. Yeah, it's hard to keep up with it. Yeah. In fact, one of the reasons we, you know, up, up until recently, we've only scheduled a month or two in advance because we never know what we're going to want to have, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah. this is the first time we've had several months scheduled in a row because of, you know, people from other parts of the country willing to present. It's been great. Yeah. We, um, so I teach a um, information security class for um, Vanderbilt and some of our labs, we use the free version of Azure just because it's easy. You get $200 worth of credits, you can set mm -hmm. it up. But we've had all types of trouble with it. It tells us that we're out of money or um, the servers can't reach the gateway. Um, do you know anything about like, are they, did they just run out of space and they're just putting the free in clusters that they're just standing up or? I don't know. They've had, they've had some some technical issues lately. A couple of times there were you know there were outages recently. But there's right, an, Microsoft has an education group. I think they have a deal where you might be able to get something better than the free version. You know, if if you're a a nonprofit or you're you're you know you're a partner that's in the education business, check out check out their education offerings. Okay. Especially okay. Vanderbilt. You know, Vanderbilt should. You know, doing it with Vanderbilt, you know, they should be able to get something from Microsoft. Yeah, I wonder if it's because we were working with NSGs and stuff. Um, like we we did do stuff on the Azure Azure like education labs, but you only had access to like a VM. Okay. You didn't have access to all the different services to see how you could secure Azure and stuff. Um, so I wonder if that's why we were using free for that portion. Don't know. John, uh, uh, just wanted to say uh, thanks for the uh, break in the middle. Uh, this is the first meetup uh, that we've had a talk where <laughs> someone has intentionally taken a break in the middle, uh, and uh, it's it's a good strategy. It's a good idea. Okay, yeah. Michael, we'll 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 adopt that from now on. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's, it's good. A good I, idea. It's a good idea. Me, We've done that at work uh, with some meetings, you know, basically if it's going more than an hour, you got to take a break, you know, otherwise you just, you know, you lose focus, uh, you know, people, sure. have, to, it's, it's, people it's, have to be it's, human. Uh, so they, <laughs> they need a drink. Almost, or they, it's, it's, it's almost like doing the networking in the middle, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's actually a lot easier to determine the best time to take breaks when, um, when everybody's got their cameras on, because you can see when they start, glossing over like the last <laughs> one of their eyes. You're like, yeah, it's, why don't we take a quick 10 minute break? Let that, uh, let that download a little bit. Yeah, when I present, I usually tell someone to remind me, you know, when I get halfway through, because I'll forget. <laughs> Keep going, going and going, you know. I, um, I, when I was, so I teach a boot camp, um, and there are three hour sessions. And typically, I mean, it depends on the material. Sometimes they would have it halfway through, so an hour and a half in, and I started noticing, like, for all of us, it's, we would finish one topic, go to the next, and then go to the next, and it doesn't give people sure. a chance to like, transition. So um, I started building in breaks every different topic. So, um, and you could tell people kind of came back a little bit more refreshed. I wasn't missing as much data, so I tried to do the same thing here. So let us know when you want to start again, John. Yeah, I think we'll just start back up. Um, I can't tell if people are back or not, but yeah, let's just keep going. <laughs> All right, networking best practice and network security group. So a lot of this is my opinion. I've got a strong networking background. I've been in networking um, since I started my career. I've got um, my CCNA. I did a lot of work um, with physical infrastructure. Um, so obviously some of this is my opinion. You guys might have different use cases, that's fine. Um, yeah, right, every situation is a little different. So complex does not equal secure. And a lot of people think that in information security. And I've worked with some individuals on the operations side of the house where um, they have traffic coming in one direction but going out another and then getting proxied and then going across to another data center and then going out because it's gonna make it incredibly hard for, sure, it's gonna make it incredibly hard for people to support it. Right? It's going to make it very hard for us to hit that A in availability. 
So for anybody that doesn't know what network security groups are, it contains a list of security rules that allow or deny network traffic to resources connecting to Azure virtual networks. I think a lot of people see NFTs and they think, cool, this is my firewall. I don't need to have a firewall. And that's incorrect. It's not a replacement for firewalls. It does some of the functions of it, but not all of it. And we'll get into it. Here's a good example. When you first look at this, and I just, I just Googled multiple DNets, um, Azure, Microsoft, um, and this is a Microsoft diagram. And this isn't about security, why they put this together. This was really about hub and spoke model and how to explain it. And they do a good job of actually explaining hub and spoke. But when you look at this, your first thought is, wow, this looks secure. I mean, we've got different virtual networks. We've got um, NSGs. We've got, oh, NSGs around each virtual network. And then we've got um, peering. We've got a firewall in here. We've got an out gateway. So cool. Um, and I would say that there's elements of this that aren't that secure, um, in my opinion. And also, you're adding complexity when you don't really need it. So I put together 10 simple network security rules. And I'll go through them. So number one, keep it simple. Right? Simplicity is sometimes the best. As long as you're meeting the intent and you're securing the infrastructure, it doesn't have to be complex. If you have 10 VNets and somebody else has one VNet, you're not better than them. Right? Um, yeah, UCIA and DIED that we talked about earlier. So um, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and defense in depth. Are we meeting those intents? Have one VNet per um, geolocation and business function. So I would have a VNet for corp. I would have a VNet for production. I would have a VNet for, and it really depends on how big your environment is. But I don't need a VNet per application. I don't need a VNet per set of database servers. One VNet holds something like 1,000 subnets. I do need the subnet. But I don't need multiple VNets to actually do that. I do need a VNet for every geolocation. I can't have one VNet in central and have another VNet in east. You should have one subnet for per solution. So application servers, your DMZ or your edge, your database servers, your management servers. You should have a different subnet for each of those. And me, I don't feel, it's very rare to have an NSG that needs to be applied to a specific machine. It's very hard to manage. It's very hard to audit. And if you can't audit easily, that means you're not keeping track of all the roles that you have. And sure, there's, there's scripts that you can pull, um, scripts that I have that I can connect to Azure, pull down all of my VNets, all of my subnets, all of my NSGs. But then I have to go through all the ports associated with them and I have to match those ports and those IP roles up with my servers and validate that those communications exist. That can be a full-time job. And if your organization is anything like any other organization I've been at, and I've been at large organizations, you don't always have the staff to do that. There's stuff that can slip through the cracks and it's those cracks where people get in. Um, think back to um, some of the credit bureaus that's been um, um, breached, right? What was it? Um, Apache wasn't updated, right? Isn't that what happened with Equifax? They went to Congress and they said the reason that everybody's social security numbers got uh, released was that one person didn't patch an Apache server. And I would say that's absolutely ludicrous. Who cares if we don't patch that server? We should have other compensating controls. Are we filtering traffic? How come we didn't know somebody was in that server? Are we looking at traffic leaving? Why don't we have an application gateway in front of it or a WAF? If there's a vulnerability on the server that's application related, there's things I can put in front of it. But if they kept their network very simple, they probably could have actually remediated some of those items. When you build an NSG, I like to have an NSG per subnet. And I like to name it matching the subnet. So if I go in and look at my NSGs, I know which ones they apply to. 
Um, egress and, e and ingress default denies. So the highest you can go up on your number is 4096, so set it there. That means any number you use before that are allow rules. But by default, they allow traffic in and out. Now in isn't as loose as the egress traffic, the, the, the traffic that leaves our network. But if you look, when you set up an NSG, it is a default allow any traffic to leave the network. That's any IP, go, that is anything internal going to any IP external. That means any country over any port. A lot of people don't know that. I've got my NSG in place, I'm secure, right? Sure, but if somebody gets in, they basically have any ability to actually get out at that point. I heard a story of somebody that allowed development to spin up their own test server in production. And it was only supposed to be up temporarily. They put an NSG around it. Somehow somebody got into that server and was mining Bitcoins using Azure for three months. Yeah. What if that network already existed, you had it hardened, they did spin up a server, maybe you can't control that, can't control everything, you're at least controlling that traffic leaving. Only open the needed ports and IP addresses, and this should say IP addresses, but ports to IP addresses. That's very difficult with outbound communication. So let's say we have a database server and we add it to our database subnet, which is protected by our database NSG. And we don't need to allow any communications going out, right? We don't need anything to leave. So you put that default deny in place. And what you'll notice is a lot of things will break. Specifically, replication, backups, um, any log analytics that you have going to your OMS workspace. Um, let's see, um, Insights, which is an incredible server tool used to look at communications and troubleshooting different um, problems with your infrastructure. It will break almost all of the Microsoft tools. So Microsoft changes their IP addresses all the time too. So how do we allow traffic to leave our network using just an NSG rule. So we would have to know all the IP addresses and all the ports that are needed to properly restrict. And then we would have to keep those updated, which is a full-time job. So scratch it, right? That's why we need a firewall. And Azure has their firewall. It's pretty good. Um, especially somebody that's very opinionated when it comes to firewalls, it's very good. But you can also get a Fortinet and you, you don't need to know anything about firewalls really. You can get something like a Fortinet or a Palo Alto. They're very easy to operate. Super easy to operate. And that gives you the ability because it's operating at layer seven and I'm not gonna get into the layers, but layer seven, it allows us to look at the URLs it's going to. So now we can put that in place. And when traffic goes out, we can just watch it. We can say allow everything. Let's just look at the traffic. This stuff is live. We don't want to affect it. So we redirect outbound traffic through this firewall. And we can sit there and just sniff traffic for a month. We're already allowing the traffic to go out. What's the risk of letting it go another month? Let's sit there and see everything it calls out to. Then let's compile all those URLs. It can't be that many. It shouldn't be that many. And put them together. Then we can build rules and slowly start restricting where they can go to without breaking anything. Now we can say this database server is allowed to communicate out to the internet, but it can't go to China. It cannot go to Russia. It can only go to a certain countries. And it can only go to certain Microsoft services and certain URLs. We drastically improve the risk. Um, yeah, and then lastly, if the item doesn't fit this list, I like to say, go back to, to item one, right? Keep it simple. Is there a way that you can add on to this list or add a function without complicating it? Is it that your item doesn't match the list or is it that you overcomplicated the item and you can simplify the solution? Because overall, I want something that operations can use, that development can use, that people can troubleshoot very easily, that can keep the lights on, that can also secure it. If you keep it simple, people will actually follow security. Make it complicated, they won't. They'll just see you as the hall monitor. And I have that nickname, I am the hall monitor. Cool. So I like the three-tiered architecture. It's tried, it's true, people argue with it, but I like it a lot. And now I wanna put a load balancer at every subnet. 
I didn't have the time to put together a diagram, so I just pulled the best one that was out there. But you can see traffic comes in through an application gateway. Microsoft's application gateways are really good. There's some functionality I wish they had, um, such as alerting when a device drops out of the health probe, right? When the health probe fails. And you have to write a query for log analytics and send something, right? I wish that was built in. But overall, it's super easy to deploy, awesome to get set up, um, solid solution. And I've used um, WAFs for a while. Microsoft's app gateway is solid. But controlling what actually comes in. So if you're using 80 or 443, which you shouldn't be using 80, let's say you are, you want to go through the application gateway and snip that traffic. Now it can be very difficult. Uh, I've got a lot of rules and my application wasn't developed the best way, so it's triggering some of these rules. Okay, disable them. Let's say you disable half your application gateway rules. Is it not secure at that point? Right, it's not ones and zeros. It's not as secure as we would like it to be, but it's way better than having nothing in front of it. And also over time, I can slowly start turning on those rules when I add exceptions or development fixes some of their issues. At least I have it in place, at least I have something. But I have it broken out, right? So how I design my, um, my VNets is um, by name. So port, prod, dev, accounting, whatever it is, right? And then the location of it. So if I have a corp East US2 and I'm replicating the central, I'm gonna have a corp central US, right? I like to have single virtual networks. I can have as many subnets as I want in there. I can have as many private spaces as I want in there. And I like to carve it out into different subnets. So I've got my web, I've got my application, I've got my data, I've got my management, which you should VPN in. Uh, never experience, expose a jump box remotely. Um, publicly, unless it's like Bastion, um, which Bastion's great. Um, and of course, you have Active Directory, which Microsoft handles it. But you can build other subnets. You can have a security subnet where you have all your security tools. I like the subnet based off of zero being the furthest, uh, closest to the internet. So zero, one, two, three, four. And also leave gaps. You never know if you need to build additional edge or DMZ subnets. So this can be zero, this can be five. And that means you have four subnets in between that you can slot in anytime that you want. It allows you to expand as large as you want to. And again, you can go up to, I think a thousand subnets. That's solid, especially if you look at, if they're slash 24s, that's a lot of IPs, a lot of IPs. But if you look at this, this covers a couple of things, right? It covers CIA and defense in depth, covers one VNet, covers a subnet per business function. It's got an NSG around each subnet, very easy to manage and secure. Um, I don't know about the default denies, it's not really um, reviewed. And it doesn't have the layer seven stuff, but we'll look at that. So we talked about this with the NSGs. So allow, um, allow to internet. Um, so I'm sorry. That's the next slide. So this is a good example of they put a deny all in place. So this is my 4096 rule. Deny everything and then they open up what they need to off of that. That's awesome. Let's open up the ports needed. I see Michael biting his fingernails and I'm just calling him out just to bring up a point real quick. And I'm sure all of you are thinking, holy crap, we don't have this in place. And, and I have this all the time. I walk into new organizations and oh my gosh, there's all this stuff that I should be doing. Well, what, what about all these vulnerabilities? Or how do I do this? Uh, this stuff is life. There's, Bob isn't even gonna let me get through the change management process. And the way you get through this is by in, inch by inch, not by yard by yard. You keep it extremely simple. So good example is the application gateway. I don't have one, I should have one, holy crap. What if, what if, what if, right? You can start by putting the application gateway in place and just routing one IP at a time. You can do one a week and let's say you have 50 sub, 50 URLs. In one year, you'll have everything routed through that. Eventually you will. You're not adding risk by not putting something in place for an extra month. The risk is already there. It's already screwed up. If you get breached, if it's been like that for 12 months and you get breached on the 13th month while you're trying to put it in, that's just bad luck. Okay, nobody's gonna fault you for that. So at least 
try and get it in place. You put in one rule at a time, but you don't just build a security architecture and move everybody to it. Never works. I've seen people build million dollar data centers. They put together all the submits, they architected everything out. They spent a year and they couldn't move the application to it because it was too complex or because the business grew and it no longer fit the design. Million dollar designs. You can secure what's already there. Yeah. John, I, I had a question for you. Um, so specifically talking about application gateways, um, so with VMs, definitely see the need. What if we're dealing with just simple uh, PaaS services? In, in oh, that? that's a good question. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's a good question. Yeah. Do, do you, you know, I, I've seen some architectures in that and just thinking through the, the, the vulnerabilities that, you know, some of them pose, I'm like, are we even over-architecting it sometimes with an application gateway in the mix? you know, or a WAF when, you know, if it's static content for a web server and it's hosted in blob storage, it's like, what are we protecting? You know? <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's, that's outstanding, right? So you're thinking for yourself, which is great. Um, and like I tell my security bootcamp, right? Always question authority. And I don't mean be jerks about it and challenge everything, but think for yourself, just because it's set in a PowerPoint slide or a book, it doesn't mean do it. So. Let's say I have um, something like that. Um, let's say I have a WordPress site that talks about the culture for our company, but it's siloed and it's off by itself. What's gonna happen? I mean, let's say there is a vulnerability and it does get patched. What's the worst thing that happens? Why do I need to add complexity by putting a WAF in front? I would say it depends. So let's say you have one of those services, but somebody can laterally move to another service. So lateral movement. And lateral move, movement really means if somebody gets here, can they get over here? Is there a way that they can actually move to different network segments? If they can't, yeah, who cares? If they can, you might want to put something in front of it or just silo it off. Yeah. Okay, cool. But really, security, and you'll see this a lot with a lot of security people, and a lot of people in the industry are trying to fix this, and there's a lot of people um, that, and not all people think this way, but they read it in a book and they say, it should be this way, so do it this way. And it really gives security a bad name. Really, anybody can do security as long as they understand how things work. I mean, you probably understand how networking works. And you know how to reverse engineer that and pop in and out of different services. So if you can do it, an attacker can do it. If you can't get into something, an attacker can. And it's really that simple. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Really good. Sounds good. Really Thanks. good question. Yeah. yeah, really good question. And here's the thing, too. If an auditor comes in and goes, you have to have an app gateway in front of this because this compliance calls for it. You can argue that. You can say I have this compensating control, right? There's ways yeah. through it. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think your uh, you know the battles that you talk about as far as like you know uh, people coming in and trying to read a book and saying okay we we have a new policy you know we're going to put an app gateway in front of everything. Um, I, I've run into that sometimes and it's it, it's it's kind of frustrating even though I'm not a specialist in security, I think through the, the, the attack vectors or the threats and I'm like, there's no attack. <laughs> you know, it's like they have, they have no, they, we have no vulnerability. We're literally spending money for nothing, adding complexity with, yeah. Yeah, and what's, what's the point? And a way around that, if you, account, um, if you encounter security people like that, is yeah. ask a couple of simple questions. Number one, what, what is, what is the risk that we're trying to remediate? So ask them to right. quantify the risk. Because that's a topic, that's something that, and it may not be that they're trying to be jerks or they're just, um, you know, some people are just stuck in their own ways and they can be difficult to work with. Yeah. Some people just don't know, right? They don't understand and yeah. they're trying to do their job. So let's see if yeah. we can help yeah. them. So they understand risk. So can you help me understand the risk associated with, can, we, can you help me quantify? It? And I'll do this with pen testers. Well, the risk associated with this is, X, Y, Z, because of this can happen. Okay, but the data behind that, did you know that it's this type of system or we're logically separated or whatever the case is? And no, I didn't know that. I mean, based off of that, would you say that's still medium or low um, risk? No, that's actually low. I actually just need to decrease that on my register. Okay, cool. Sometimes they just don't know, but I would um, do that. And then I would, um, if you come, you go too strong, they might get um, a little defensive and, oh, he's just, Right, and they put more, so you try and partner with them. Hey, let's go out to lunch, let's talk about this. Maybe you can teach me stuff, maybe I can teach you stuff. 
but a lot of people are trying to get into that mindset. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Uh, that, those are really good topics. I'm glad you brought that up, Mike. It makes it more um, um, dynamic. So here's a, one of the examples of the NSG that we were talking about where um, it's allowed everything. So this is default, 65001, and you can't delete this rule. You can only put a deny all in front of it. So allow internet outbound, any, any, any internet. So by default, if somebody puts this in place and they get on the server, they can basically take all your information. And let's take out the hackers trying to break in. Let's think about internal employees. Let's think about developers. Let's think about developers that want to test their application locally and they need a database to actually do that. Gives developers the ability, if they can get on the box, the ability, and some of them need to be, gives them the ability to take the database and download it to their laptop. They might not even know anybody. And now all of your production data is on their laptop. Yeah, that happens, right? So we want to prevent that from happening. And we talked about the firewall, right? So egress communication, send it through a firewall. You don't even have to turn it on. You never have to turn it on. At least you, at, at a minimum, get visibility. Where are your servers communicating to? Do you know who your servers are talking to? Target's a good example. So, um, actually, there's so many, voila. Um, they're breached. People were in there for three, six, nine months. How do they not see it? It's because they don't have visibility. If they saw that traffic was leaving their network on weird ports where there was large packets leaving, or weird um, communications going to an IP address we don't know, well, we can at least sever that connection but we need to be able to see it. We're right at the tail end of this, guys. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, encryption protocols, SSL search, and key vaults. Seems like a lot. We're gonna go through it pretty quick. So key vaults, if you haven't used a key vault before, um, it's pretty simple. It's basically Microsoft's version of um, the open source tool vault. You can store certificates in there, passphrases, keys, identities. Um, it's pretty cool. But it's not just a password manager or certificate um, tool, what you can use. And if you work with development, a lot of developers aren't up to speed yet. Some of them are. And if you find the ones that are subject matter experts, the ones that um, really like messing with Docker containers and some of the newer technologies, go out to lunch with them, talk to them about it. A lot of times applications, they store their username and passwords in config files. Sometimes they're best, sometimes they're not. But if I get on, if I break into a DMZ server, the first thing I'm gonna look at is I'm gonna look at what application is hosted and I'm gonna look for the config files. And if I get to the config files, I'm probably gonna find a connection string and a username and password. At that point, all I have to do is connect to the database. The application account is probably privileged because it's saving data typically. I'm gonna take that data and I'm gonna try and laterally move that data out of the environment. So what's cool about Azure Key Vault, and I've got a PowerShell script that I can pass you guys. But um, yeah, you can actually generate identities for your applications and give it permissions to Key Vaults. So you can have a Key Vault per solution or per application. Obviously don't complicate it, but then you can generate an identity that you give the developers and that identity has the ability to connect to the key vault and pull credentials out. So that means if somebody does break in, sure, they still have access to the server and to the key vault, but they need the application to make the call using the identity to get those credentials out. Makes it a lot more difficult. Right? It's not if somebody breaks in, it's when. But we want to make it as difficult as possible. And this isn't that hard of a concept. A lot of people overthink it. Um, it's actually a really easy concept. You just got to find developers that want to you want to do a skunk project, test it, verify it works, and then you can push it through product to get it deployed across your whole org. All you need is a couple people to listen to. Just go out to lunch with them, be friends with them. They want to secure stuff too. All servers that you deploy, they have TLS 1.0, 1.1 enabled. Disable it by default. I've got a script and I can send you guys my GitHub page. Um, not all the scripts are mine. I would say most of them are. But here's a good example of a script that um, you can use. I forget where I got it from. But um, you can execute on your server. So when you deploy it, 
execute the script. It disables all the old um, encryption protocols. It disables 3.0, 1.1, 1.0. Um, but what's great about it is, let's say you disable all of them, you install an app and the app doesn't work because of it. it's using an old Java ODBC driver or whatever the case is. That's okay, at least you know about it. Get approval, you turn back on that one encryption, maybe it's 1.1. Okay, that's better than allowing all of them to be turned on. But you can just execute a script and turn all that off. Um, and I didn't add this to this, um, but I've got another script that uses an Excel file. You can put in every Microsoft predefined bloatware. If you deploy a server from Microsoft in Azure, it installs Xbox Live on it, right? And I have no idea why they do that. I'm sure they have some reason, but Xbox Live is turned on. And you can disable the service. Cool. But if somebody gets on, they can enable the service. Harder. So I've got a script that will actually go through and it'll look at an Excel file for any Microsoft installed app which is Xbox Live, Cortana, whatever you want. And it'll go through and actually uninstall all the bloatware. So uninstall the bloat. Harden your servers by disabling old encryption protocols and ciphers. Um, application gateway hardening, this is a good one. And this is something I didn't know until um, I guess the last three to six months. But by default, yes, um, TLS 1.1 is turned, or 2, 1.2 is turned on, and it'll try and negotiate with that. But did you know that application gateways have 1.0 and 1.1 turned on, and it'll default to that if it can't negotiate on 1.2? Well, maybe I don't want them to. And yes, I could have it disabled on the servers. But what if I can't disable it on the servers, or what if there's some other issue? So, what you can do. And this is another script that I have, is you can go in and you just create a new policy with the ciphers, with the protocols you want to use. It's actually one liner that you can use. And then you just apply that policy to the application gateway, it's done. You can't do it in the GUI, they don't tell you about it in the GUI. But you can do it um, via the command line. So how I found this is through vulnerability scanning and pen testing. Popped up that we were using some old ciphers and they weren't horrible. I think it came up as a low risk, very low risk. It, it's not anything that would, people would really even bat an eye at. I thought it was pretty interesting that almost every modern browser doesn't use those protocols. And I think even XP doesn't use them anymore. So why do they have them just enabled? And it's really because some, some devices out there still need them. But every phone, most of them um, only need the top four snipers enabled and they can communicate. Every device out there. Um, this is a good one. So for storage accounts and for SQL servers, set your minimal TLS version to 1.2. Microsoft does a really good job of this now that they set it to 1.2 by default before you actually had to specify that. But uh, make sure it's set and then make sure whoever you're giving permissions to within your Azure subscription can't change it. How many times is an operations folk struggling to get a product working with development or with the application team. And they're feeling heat and they go and they toggle it from 1.2 to 1.0 and all of a sudden the application works. Great, we're up and running. But they don't tell anybody they did it or they don't understand the impact. So now you just enabled a protocol that honestly wouldn't be supported by um, PCI. So we wanna make sure that only certain individuals can toggle these settings. And if somebody does need to Turn on 1.0, right? Availability is so important. Do not say, oh, well, we have to have TLS 1.2. 1.0 is not secure. No, it's secure. It's just not as secure. Right? It's not ones and zeros. It's more important that we get the customers up and working than making sure that we have 1.2 enabled, to be honest with you. Cool. So in summary, right? Um, use secure certificates with at least 256 bit. Yeah, that's totally wrong. 260, yeah. Bit encryption. Uh, store certificates, passwords and identities in Key Vault. If you have passwords, use them in Key Vault. You can at least log who accesses those passwords. So if we have a shared password, a shared account that we just can't get away from using, put in Key Vault. When somebody goes and actually looks at that password, at least you know who accessed it. And yes, they can copy it and save it on their computer. Cool. Right? We're trying to do the best we can here. 
Um, disable old encryption protocols and old ciphers. Change default rules on app gateway. Um, ensure storage accounts, apps, and databases are at a minimum of 1.2. Enable file, firewalls on storage accounts and database servers. So I didn't get enough time to put screenshots in for this. But by default, if you stand up a database server or a storage account, blob storage, by default, and I think now it actually asks you if you want to make it public or not. Yeah, in the last month, I think they changed it. But before that, by default, it gives full access to the internet. All IPs on the internet. And yes, you have to have a key to connect to it. But why even have it on the internet? If you have a bunch of internal servers that are connected to it, why even allow it? So at least restrict it to the IP, the public IPs that it's going to connect from. Same with the database servers. And you want to do that when you stand it up because if you have a bunch of storage accounts that are already set up, it's very hard to go back and to determine who's actually connecting to them. You got to run a lot of queries, a lot, a lot of connections, right? You have to dig through logs to determine who's connecting to it, if they should connect to it, and then lock it down by IPs. It's exhausting. So turn it on by default. And when people can't connect to it, ask them what they're trying to do, and then allow them to do it. At least you'll have a finite rule set. And then lastly, I don't know if you're using them yet, but private links, they're awesome. Private links give you the ability to take a public resource like a storage account, database servers, an application, and put it on your local subnet. So for example, let's say we have a database server that we don't want anybody to connect to remotely. If a database admin needs to connect to it, they can be PNN. So why have it accessible to the internet? Now we can still have, in case of emergency, break glass. We enable it on the internet and people can connect to it, right? It's still there. We can still get to the management concept. But if we don't need to, why expose it to the internet? So what you want to do is create a private link. And all you're doing is you're saying, hey, I want this resource to be on this subnet and grab an IP for it. And from there, after you add that, you can use host file entries, you can use DNS, you can use anything that you want, but you can repoint the applications to use a private IP address instead of a public one. Now all of your sensitive data, you can wall off from the internet. Um, very easy to use, it was in, I used it when it was in preview back in November, December, it's been pretty solid. They had DNS problems associated with it. Um, the documentation, if you read three different uh, documents on it, they give you three different um, answers for how DNS was actually, um, how DNS actually worked. So it was very difficult. Um, I went back and revisited it a couple of months ago. It's phenomenal. It works really well. And it's solid. Um, it's out of preview. Um, and that's it. So I know that was a lot of information. Um, if anybody wants the slide deck, let me know. Um, you can go ahead and um, shoot me a LinkedIn um, message. I'll go ahead and send you the slide deck. Yeah, send it, yeah. uh, John, send it to me and I'll put it up on the meetup group site. Perfect. Yeah. Well, so unless John, just send me a link to it if you have it somewhere. Yeah, perfect. I'll send you that. Um, also, if anybody wants, I put together, I don't have a lot, but I have a lot of really good uh, PowerShell script that I'm constantly adding stuff to every two or three weeks. Um, yeah, I'll send you my GitHub page. It's all um, open stuff. Um, if, it, if it's something I didn't write, it's actually listed in there. If it's something I wrote, it's probably in there. I'll feel free to use it as you want. Um, yeah, cool. Oh, thanks a lot, John. That was a, a great presentation. Appreciate all that information. Everybody can digest it. And you know, like I say, send me the presentation. I'll make sure the group gets it. The, the only thing I would add is if, when it comes to the hub and spoke network discussion, it, yeah. Yeah, you know, usually we recommend that people will set up a separate uh, separate subscription for dev test because there are dis discounts involved in that. So you can save some, you know, can you have a yeah. prod and a non-prod subscription and save money in your in your non-prod subscription. And hub and spoke architecture is something that I'm very fond of, but yeah, <laughs> there's lots of different ways to slice that. You know, the uh, oh, yeah. the, the the architect's answer is it all depends, right? <laughs> so Oh yeah. It does. It depends on your situation. And yeah. typically, I try and keep things simple. And if I'm in a very large enterprise, I'm probably going to do things a little differently. It could depend on, um, you could have different IT operations team, and that makes sense to actually break them out. And to Bill's point, absolutely. So in every environment I've worked in, yes, we absolutely create a separate subscription for our dev test. Absolutely. So multiple subscriptions 
absolutely. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any more, more comments or questions or feedback, whatever? You know, like I say, we're an informal group. And if you guys, if you guys come up with any questions later on, um, you can just Google me and find my LinkedIn. Feel free to send me any messages. I'm all about um, giving back and sharing any knowledge I have. Um, if you have any knowledge that you think I should know, please pass it over. There's so much I don't know. You know, I've got a I've got a you know, a blog post somewhere that talks about how the more you learn, the more there is to learn, and you'll you know the circle keeps getting bigger and bigger, and the unknowns keep getting larger and larger. But you shouldn't let that stop you. You should you know the one the one skill I have and the one skill that you need is the ability to learn new things because with Azure it changes every few weeks. You know. Oh yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording now. And I will be posting the recording in the YouTube channel. So you, you guys will get it. Let's see, how do I stop it? <laughs> oh, you know what? I think I'm still uh, owner, so. Oh, yeah, stop. Uh, 